Welcome back to the next episode of What's Up Prof. Hello, Walter. Hi, we have a hot topic today. Yes, let's get right into it. I'll open with a word of prayer. Okay. Our Heavenly Father, thank you very much for bringing us again together. We ask a blessing on the discussion. We ask the working of the Holy Spirit to enlighten us and to make our minds think upon the things that you want us to think. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Yes, this is sometimes a controversial subject. It's been a controversial subject from the beginning. Yeah, because we have two parties in the world. Mm -hmm. And people think we have hundreds of parties. There are only two. two. So, you come from the education world. So this must be something that really has an impact on your life. Absolutely. This is uh, probably the most important topic. And uh, I have been on both sides of this argument now. And, well, we'll have to talk about the issues and then we'll see uh, how this all comes together. Okay. It's a it's a historic problem, and it will be a end time culminative problem. Yeah, we're talking today about a new education. Mm. There's a lot of talk about a new education. Actual fact: the Bible already says there's nothing new under the sun. Mm. Uh, I think what they are talking about is a consolidated education, which they will call a new education, which happens to be the old education, which finally has arrived at the point of universal acceptance. Okay. Yeah, and it also stems from the Pope, where he wanted to have this re-education uh, seminar. seminar, get together, and then the COVID-19 Put that on hold till October, and then they had a yes. virtual get-together on yes. this. Well, we need to talk about this. I believe that this is one of the most important topics for our time. This is the topic that will finally determine the outcome of all choices. Mm. It's very important very that important. we talk about it. So let's jump right into it. Thank you. This is the Vatican News from 15 October 2020, and the Pope calls for a global compact on education, bears in itself a seed of hope. I, of course, beg to differ, but that's just the nature of things. So let's see why we beg to differ. It's one thing to say that you differ, mm -hmm. but you need to qualify yes. when you want to say something like that. So Pope Francis relaunches the Global Compact on Education on Thursday with a video message during a virtual event at Rome's Pontifical Lateran University. Let's make that quite clear. That's the Jesuit <laughs> <laughs> Holy <laughs> Grail, right? <laughs> In this situation, the Pope called for a new cultural and development model that respects and protects human dignity, while creating a global interdependence to bring communities and people together to care for our common home and to foster peace. That's a very loaded statement. It has everything in it from communities to his encyclical on the environment, to yes. his encyclical on fraternity, yes. all of these issues. Education, the Pope said, is meant to be transformative. In what direction? Mm -hmm. It should present a hope that can shatter the determinism and fatalism of selfishness of the strong. It should shatter the conformism of the weak and the ideology of the utopians as the only way forward. The Pope pointed out that education is a natural antidote to the individualistic culture 
that at times degenerates into a true cult of the self and the primacy of indifference. He has a thing about individualism because the Catholic Church throughout history wanted conformity to its will. Yeah. And any individualist who was a free thinker was an enemy of the church. And to this day, they haven't changed their stance. Not at all. This, of course, would get rid of all free thinkers. There would be no Hus. There would be no Martin Luther. There would be no John Knox. Mm. There would be no Latimer. There would be no Cranmer. None of them would exist. There would be no Wesley. There would be nobody who thinks differently to the rest of society. Mm. The commitment of every level of society, he said, is needed for a renewed kind of education that is not tempted to look the other way and thus favor grave social injustices violations of rights, terrible forms of poverty, and the waste of human lives. This is interesting. This is the richest organization in the history of humanity. Mm. But it doesn't seem to bother itself with these issues. And yes, they have a lot of social work that they do, but not out of their coffers. It has to come from donations from outside. Yeah. Let's listen to what he had to say. This is his speech concerning this issue. Noi riteniamo che l'educazione è una delle vie più efficaci per umanizzare il mondo e la storia. L'educazione è soprattutto una questione di amore e di responsabilità che si trasmette nel tempo di generazione in generazione. L'educazione quindi si propone come il naturale antidoto alla cultura individualistica che a volte degenera in vero e proprio culto del io e nel privato dell'indifferenza. Il nostro futuro non può essere la divisione, l'impoverimento delle facoltà di pensiero e di immaginazione, di ascolto, di dialogo e di muta comprensione. Il nostro futuro non può essere questo. Oggi c'è bisogno di una rinnovata stagione di impegno educativo che coinvolga tutte le componenti della società. Well, he's made it quite clear that individualism is his enemy. Yes on every level, whether it be cultural or otherwise. Mm -hmm. Every level, individualism is the enemy of the church and the enemy of the community. And so we have to be uniform. I mean, if you take uh, the Jesuit reductions in South America, where they used the Indian labor and organized mm. them into reductions, which became the model for communism. Then you have this kind of fruit yes. of that kind of thinking. Everybody is the same and uh, nothing but total misery because it curtails your freedom. Mm. Now, let's just look at this history and see where all of this came from and why there is this clash of thinking. Here's an interesting article that appeared uh, in the University of Arizona documents. And this document is about Martin Luther, who was an advocate for education reform. So Martin Luther asked for a new education. Yeah. Interesting, right? It is interesting, yes. So what was wrong with the old education? And let's just make it quite clear. Who ran the old education? Correct. The Roman, the Roman Catholic, Catholic Church, Church right? Yes. So Martin Luther advocated for a new education. Now this article was written in 2017. And it says, In his quest to help Christians read and understand Scripture for themselves, 
Luther favored compulsory education for all. His views on education will be discussed as part of the April 11 early book lecture series at the University of Arizona. In the article it says, During a time when school often was limited to the sons of the wealthy, Luther argued for compulsory education for all. His main reason, education was necessary so that Christians could read and understand scripture for themselves. That was the sola that, scriptura basis, right? That's the whole reason that what? he wanted compulsory education for. And all. he wanted literacy for yes, all. so that people could understand their Bibles. Correct. Luther was determined to wrestle control of the schools from the Roman Catholic Church. So he had a problem with them, right? Mm -hmm. One of the reasons Luther is approaching the city fathers is he wants the primary responsibility for education to be grasped by those men and taken away from the ecclesiastics in the town. Now, all the schools in those days were run by the church. And historically, the universities of the world were all church yes. institutions. And this is the document that he wrote to the rulers. This is an original, which this university, by the way, bought a copy of. And uh, it states quite clearly what his views on education was. It's a very famous document. This is one of the, the sentences that Martin Luther wrote to the rulers of the time. My dear sirs, if we have to spend such large sums every year on guns, roads, bridges, dams, and countless similar items to ensure the temporal peace and prosperity of a city, why should not much more be devoted to the poor neglected youth? A city's best and greatest welfare, safety, and strength consists rather in its having many able, learned, wise, honorable, and well-educated citizens. Luther also espoused a classical education. So well, why did he want all of this as well? So that people had a broad view and they could understand the issues. Mm -hmm. First introduced during the Renaissance, and that included history, languages, such as Greek, Hebrew, and Latin, believing such a broad education would aid in the study of the Bible. Now, in our own denomination, we have certain guidelines as well, mm -hmm. which, had they been followed to the letter, would have blessed beyond our wildest dreams. And uh, it has been suggested that what was taught in the schools of the prophets should also be the basis for education. Yes. And there was sacred history. So history is mm -hmm. very important. There was sacred music. There was prophecy. There was the study of the Bible. And then there were practical issues such as gardening, mm -hmm. how to do farming, sustaining uh, education in terms of practical issues. That was the education that was supposed to be there. But unfortunately, that is not what has happened. Now, here's a, another publication that I found very interesting. This comes from Teach Diligently, Resources for Christian Education. It also gives the views of Martin Luther on education reformation. So, a new education. Mm -hmm. Reforming the universities, Luther wrote, the universities need a sound and thorough reformation. Loose living is practiced there. Little is taught of the Holy Scriptures or the Christian faith. The blind pagan teacher Aristotle is of more consequence than Christ. Do we have a similar situation in the world today? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. But there are still remnants mm -hmm. here and there of people that believe what Martin Luther said. So you still have some church schools that try, uh, in spite of the flood of opposite education, to try and cope. Mm -hmm. 
But of course, curricula are so designed that even if you are yes. in a school of private education, you still have to conform to certain mm -hmm. norms in order to get into mainstream yeah. education. And to be acknowledged. Correct. And when you get to mainstream education, well, then you get into the secular universities, which, by the way, were not secular in the beginning. Yes. But even then, they were started by the Roman Catholic system. Reforming the universities. Luther argued that the universities needed reform because he knew the impact they have on future generations. Universities shape and mold future leaders, including Christian leaders. And he said, for Christian youth and those of our upper classes with whom abides the future of Christianity will be taught and trained in the universities. In my view, no work more worthy of the Pope and the Emperor could be carried out than a true reformation of the universities. On the other hand, nothing could be more wicked or serve the devil better than unreformed universities. In actual fact, he was saying that the universities served the devil mm -hmm. and were wicked. Yeah. That's what he was saying. That's what he was they saying. needed a reformation. The Bible and education. Luther did not limit his comments to the university as he believed the Bible ought to be central to all education. Now, is that acceptable in the world today? No, not at all. Absolutely <laughs> not. Luther knew the obligation Christian parents have to train their children in the faith, and this begins in the lower levels of education. He wrote, above all, the most important and most Usual teaching in both the universities and the lower schools ought to be concerned with the Holy Scriptures. Oh, how unwisely we deal with our poor young folk, whom we are commanded to train and instruct. But we shall have to give a serious account of our stewardship and explain why we have not set the word of God before them. We fail to notice the present pitiful distress of the young people. Though they live in the midst of a Christian world, they faint and perish in misery because they lack the gospel in which we should be training and exercising them all the time. That is something that doesn't exist in the world today. No. It's actually sad, if you come to think of it, after this, that he wrote in the Reformation days, yes. that Chris, even though there were Christian universities and schools and everything, they eventually moved over back to, to the a secular. Totally secular system. Now, who was responsible? We'll have to look at that. Towards the end of Luther's essay, we read his classic line on education, and his advice would be well heeded by parents today. Mm. He writes, but I would not advise anyone to send his son to a place where the Holy Scriptures do not come first. Well, where can you send your children then? Nowhere. No way. How many parents have sent believing children to secular universities only to get them back mm -hmm. as atheists and infidels? Every institution where the word of God is not taught regularly must fail. That is why we observe the kind of people who are now and will continue to be in the universities. I greatly fear that the universities are but wide open gates leading to hell. As they are not diligent in training and impressing the Holy Scriptures on young students. My wife's grandmother cried many, many tears because her children were all highly educated and became professors at the universities. But they all became atheists. Mm -hmm. And so what Martin Luther said here is absolutely true. Now, I did not become an atheist when I went to the university because I already was one. Yeah. And why was I an atheist? 
Why was because that? of the education. Because of the education I received at school. And the education at school, and particularly the education I received in religious instruction by through the Roman Catholic system, uh, made sure that I was an atheist even by the time I got to the university. Fascinating. And then the author of this article is Zachary Garris. And let me just say who he is. Zachary Garris is an attorney and author. He holds a Master of Divinity from the Reformed Theological Seminary, Jackson, Missouri, and a Juris Doctor from Wayne State University Law School. He is licensed to preach in the Presbyterian Church in America. And he has taught high school and Sunday school courses on ancient history, early church history, medieval history, logic, Bible systematic theology, covenant theology, apologetics, and worldview. So he's a well-educated man. And his conclusion is, we are witnessing exactly what Luther warned against. Failed institutions. The majority of our schools and universities have failed to train students in the wisdom of Christ and they have instead trained students in a progressive and anti-Christian worldview. It is no stretch to say that our schools and universities are responsible for much of the moral chaos of our day. They have opened the gates to hell and only the grace of God can overcome them. This is a very modern document. Yeah. And the conclusion is the same as was reached by Martin Luther 500 years ago. Now, I've come through this training and education. It's interesting that Martin Luther was for educating all classes, Mm. even girls. And that was a no-no in those days. And he himself had, I think it was three daughters. One died at birth. One died when she was 13 years old. But uh, he advocated for schools and he started a school in Wittenberg where the girls could attend so that they could be educated and could understand and read and understand these things. This was the kind of education that Protestantism brought to the world. Yes. And the last vestiges of this education must now be destroyed. There's another fascinating article. It comes from Steemit, The War Against Books to Set Up Learning Against Learning is a Jesuit Strategy. The phrase learning against learning comes from Cardinal Thomas Wolsey addressing the Pope about the dangers of the printing press to the church's control. How can you say that the printing press is a danger to the church. In other words, knowledge, true knowledge, is a danger to the church. The goal of the Catholic Church became to start a war against books. As D. Irayli put it in the last chapter, War Against Books, in his book, Amenities of Literature from 1841. This is also referring to the Gutenberg Press that was developed right in the Reformation. Absolutely. It was the enemy of the the papacy. Why? Because it put the word of God into people's hands and the literature that went along with it. The writings of Martin Luther, for example. It is traced to Ignatius Loyola's rules for Jesuits. I was the founder of the Jesuit order, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, there were three founders, actually. It was Ignatius Loyola. Mm -hmm. He was the founder. Then there was Peter Faber, who was the German co-founder of the Jesuits. And he is the one who actually brought the philosophy of learning uh, to this illustrious group. And then there was Francis Xavier. Now, he was the one that lived the shortest. And Faber was really the one that drove the philosophy. But uh, Ignatius Loyola, he's the one who had the visions and created the the exercises exercises. of Loyola. So the grand rule of the order is to make thinking conform 
with the Catholic Church, elaborated in 18 specific rules, of which rule number 13 says, the 13th and finally, that we may be altogether of the same mind and in conformity with the Church herself. No individualistic thinking. Interesting. If she shall have defined anything to be black, which is to our eyes appears to be white, we ought in like manner to pronounce it to be white. Autograph the 13th, that we may in all things attain the truth, that we may not err in anything, we ought ever to hold it as a fixed principle that what I see white, I believe to be black. If the hierarchical church so define it, to be. That's the spiritual of exercises of Ignatius Loyola. I cannot bring myself to say saint, but it says there, saint. 1541. Unbelievable. No, no, that's really unbelievable. You don't have any thoughts of yourself. So sorry, if you see something, it's white, and the church says it's black, isn't this just, just what the Pope said in other words? Didn't we just listen to his speech? Yep. If you don't agree with him, you have no right There's no room for you. There's no room for you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> he writes further in this article, the dastardly Bertrand Russell explains this strategy was embraced by Johann Fichte, who laid it down that education should aim at destroying free will and that the social psychologists of the future will have a number of classes of school children on whom they will try different methods of producing an unshakable conviction that snow is black. Is there a reference there yes. to what Loyola said? Yep. The blameworthy culprit for setting up learning against learning and waging a war on books are Ignatius Loyola, Thomas Woolsey, Johann Fichte and Bertrand Russell. Isaac the Israeli deserves credit for fighting against the Jesuits. And here are the sources for the document. This is not a conspiracy. Mm -mm. This is a fact of history. And so many people argue and fight against it because they are part of the very institutions which practice Loyola's instructions mm -hmm. on the minds of young people in our universities. Now, is it true that our universities do this? Now, I have some experience in this. I was at one of the largest universities in our country where I taught and I was an atheist and I taught evolution and there was a theology department in that university mm -hmm. but it could not <laughs> counteract what the evolutionists were saying. And to this day when you switch on the radio they have programs where my ex-colleagues are proclaiming the virtues of evolution and the ignorance and stupidity of those who believe the Bible. I attended an interesting uh, <laughs> meeting once where one of the high channels in the world, that is one of the occult channels, informed me that the universities were being instructed in occultism by these very occultists. And we're talking now about the theological seminaries. And if you attend those schools of theology in the world today, you, le you read and learn about what all the learned men have said about religion. And Karl Barth becomes more important than the Word of God. There is, in most of the seminaries, no real study of the Word of God. Nobody comes out of those universities knowing what the book of Daniel is all about. Yeah. The Reformers knew, yeah. but the so-called Reformed seminaries don't teach it. Yeah. They have no clue as to what the book of Revelation is about. 
or what Revelation 13 is about. They should at least know what the Reformers taught, Mm -hmm. but they don't. They learn what infidels have said, and that becomes the norm. Now, at one stage, I was actually persuaded (laughs) that I should get a degree in theology because it seems to be a mindset Mm -hmm. of the people that if you do not have a degree in theology, then you better refrain from any theological issue. Yes. Have you come across that? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Yes. And uh, I was often confronted with this kind of thinking. It sounds a little bit to me, and when I was confronted with it, it, uh, I heard almost the Pharisees shouting there, Yes, you who know, is this man who has this? not known letters? <laughs> <laughs> so they condemned the disciples, they condemned John, they condemned Jesus himself, right? Yeah. So I had one stage decided I'm going to thwart these, these intellectuals at the colleges and universities and get a degree in theology. And uh, I went to the university where I was teaching at the time And I went to the theological seminary, which was Protestant, Mm -hmm. and said, I want to enroll for a degree in theology. What must I do? Well, I was professor at that stage, and I had, you know, PhD in in science. And so the man said to me, well, well, that's very fascinating. You know, you have so many degrees already. What we need to do is to give you a bridging course. You'll write an exam and then you'll go straight into a master's and then later into a doctoral thesis. And I said, well, that's wonderful. Let's do that. And he said, well, you can start the thesis immediately if you want to. Have you any topic in mind? Well, I thought to myself, you know, how am I going to do this quickly? <laughs> so I said, well, can't I do a thesis on Genesis versus modern scientific thinking? He nearly had a heart failure <laughs> and said, no, 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 that won't do because we will not align ourselves with anything that is contrary to the evolutionary paradigm. So I said, well, so a thesis where you constructively compare uh, the scriptural story with the scientific uh, knowledge of the day, and even if it should support some of the scriptural issues, would not be satisfactory? And he said, absolutely not. We will not make fools of ourselves. So I said, okay, that's fine. So we'll leave that topic. Now, at that stage, I was very interested in uh, the New Age movement and all of the philosophies of these self-proclaimed messiahs Mm -hmm. and also uh, the appearances of these messiahs, which were all contrary to Scripture. So I suggested a thesis on the biblical criteria for the biblical messiah versus the messiahs in the world out there, which is a very broad field. And he looked at me with this glassy look, and he said to me, uh, which biblical messiah are you referring to? Okay. Now, this is a Protestant, (laughs) theologian speaking, right? And I looked at him and I asked him... um, is there more than one? (laughs) And he said, oh yes, the Bible is all allegories. Everybody is a Messiah or a potential Messiah. So I said to him, very well, I will think about it. And I left it at that, realizing that argument was absolutely not achieving anything. And I got back to my office and I thought to myself, well, if this is the education that the theologians have, then they're welcome to it. (laughs) I will be satisfied with my scientific knowledge and whatever I can glean out of the writings of the Word of God and those that support it. But that was as far as it went. 
In the meantime, of course, I I do have a degree in theology, but yeah. uh, that's well, you actually story. have an honorary doctorate. That's right, but that's another story. Let's not Keep go there. there. Let's not go there. So the blameworthy culprits are Ignatius Loyola, Thomas Wolseley, Johann Fichte, and Bertrand Russell. This is very interesting. But let's get to a modern time. We've compared now what the ancient conflict in education was. This is now our illustrious president of France, who of course has Jesuit education, right? Yes. And he's a friend of the, the Pope. Pope. Very, very, very much friend. so. And uh, this is Catholic family. France moves to ban homeschooling in 2021. Now, what is there in homeschooling that is so undesirable? It's the fact that people can educate their children in ways that might be contrary to the wishes of some of these illustrious gentlemen, right? Yes, when the, when the syllabus teaches something, the parent or any can tutor it. can correct and say, okay, this is what's being taught here, but this is not the truth. Or and here's an alternative. Here's an alternative. Yeah. So French President Emmanuel Macron announced on Friday morning that he intends to outlaw homeschooling for all children except those who have a health condition that would justify staying away from school. He also intends to step up control on private independent schools that receive no public funds. That's interesting. You see, if you receive public funds, then you are subject to the government. Yes. And you have to make sure that that curriculum is taught. So anybody who has any mind of his own there will have to be curtailed, right? In particular, through inspections on the curricula taught there by more severely implementing a recent law that requires such schools to teach a common core defined by a high authority for education. Didn't the Pope call for a new education? Yeah. He's a very high authority. I wonder whether the sub-authority must be in harmony with the very high yeah, authority. You see, this is the same. Okay, Luther had also the same type of language. Yes. But where, where we're going with this, we'll quite clearly see. We'll see in a moment. He said, School is the Republican melting pot. It what makes it possible for us to protect our children in a complete way from any religious sign from religion. So there's the difference. There's the difference. This is fascinating. What religion is he against? Well, it seems like all religion. Uh -huh. But why not throw them all into the pot when you actually are against one particular exactly. one, right? Yeah. It is truly the heart of the space of secularism. And it is this place where we form consciences so that children become free, rational citizens able to choose their own lives. The school is therefore our collective treasure it is what allows us in our society to build this common thing that is the republic. That's exactly what Martin Luther warned against. Mm -hmm. Where the scriptures are sidelined, this will be the result. And here they will form the minds so that snow is black. Yeah. This is a speech he made after the um, radical Islamic attacks that were in France. But like we've read now and we'll still read, this pertains to all religion because France is a secular country. Secular state. Macron said very clearly that the school of the Republic aims to protect children from religion. He added, that is no doubt one of the most radical since the laws of 1882 and those ensuring school co-education between boys and girls in 1969. From the start of the 2021 school year, school instruction will be made compulsory for all from the age of three. That takes away the influence of the parents mm -hmm. completely. completely. 
Homeschooling will be strictly limited, particularly to health reasons. We are therefore changing our paradigm and it is vital. In the same vein, he said, the Republic was built around the school which trains more than individuals. It raises citizens. It shapes free minds. That is why I'm convinced that the Republic will resist through schools those who want to fight or divide it. And it is through schools that we will allow all our children to access knowledge, culture and Republican civic mindedness and thus to fully become men and women citizens. In other words, your mind must be conformed to the way the government wants it to be formed, mm. which in turn is decided by a higher authority that sits in Rome. Yes, so this sounds like it will be secular, but Rome embraces secularism. Now, it's very useful to use a radical religion in order to finally get rid of all religion. Yes. And to take away the right of the parent to instill norms and values into the minds of their children. Now, here are lists of some countries where homeschooling is already illegal. And you see the list is very long. It's Germany, Greece, Hungary... Montenegro, ne Netherlands, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia. I mean, the list is very long. We don't have to go through it all. And this is just some of them. And it includes Islamic countries like Turkey and uh, Germany is a Protestant, a Christian, Christian, Protestant, Catholic country. Catholic, yeah. So if we can dump all religions in there, it would be rather useful. Now, This book, Rulers of Evil, is a book that everybody, I think, should read at some stage. It's a very interesting book. In this book, Rulers of Evil, he talks about the power of the Jesuit order mm. and that they are the pinnacle of those who rule over society in these days. Referring to the Jesuits, he writes, their head would be a supreme general in the constitutions which Ignatius was writing. The superior general would be obeyed and reverenced at all times as the one who holds the place of Christ our Lord. The phrase holds the place of Christ means that the superior general would share with the Pope at a level unperceived by the general public the divine title of Vicar of Christ first claimed by Gelasius I on May 13, 495. Loyola completed constitutions would repeat 500 times that one is to see Christ in the person of the superior general. So this is how they run, and you must obey absolutely. Then he has the Jesuit oath in there. Now, just for interest's sake, the Jesuits were to become the schoolmasters of Europe. Okay. Yes. And they also ran the Council of Trent, as they ran the Second Vatican Council. Yeah. So the Second Vatican Council, on the surface, appears to be the opposite of the Council of Trent, but in actual fact, it's exactly the same mm -hmm. thing, just very cleverly devised. So most of the 18-year lifetime of the Council of Trent consisted of two intermissions spanning four and ten years each. At the beginning of the second intermission, Ignatius founded a special college in Rome for German-speaking Jesuits called the Germanacio. Interesting. Three years later, the Peace of Augsburg established the principle of Cuis Regio Eus Religio, Who's the region? He's the religion. In other words, when you were in a particular area, mm -hmm. then you were Protestant. If you were in another area, you were Catholic, right? And the Peace of Augsburg was Jesuit paid They could now bring whole populations to Rome simply by winning over a few princes. So if you get the prince? Then the rest, if you're living in, in that area... 
you fall under what the prince believes. Because the people in those days weren't allowed to think for themselves. Mm -hmm. The prince was going to think for them, and the prince was subject to the church. The fruits of the Germanicum were so successful that when the Council of Trent finally adjourned on December 4, 1563, its decrees and canons conceded nothing to the Protestant reformers. Indeed, under the spiritual direction of Superior General Diego Lanes, Ignatius had died in 1556, the council denied every Protestant doctrine point by point. So this is where the war begins. And then it gets interesting, my young brother, because it says, it was inevitable, this is on page 65, it was inevitable that the Council of Trent would establish the Jesuits as the schoolmasters of Europe. With money from royalty and commerce and not so much as a tannic from the church. Sure. Yeah. So they take it all from the society, which is the way they work to this mm -hmm. very day. So this rich organization rolling in treasures mm -hmm. and gold beyond the imagination is always talking about the poor, poor every time but exploits the poor in order to supposedly help the poor the society built an extensive system of schools and colleges no tuition was charged but each prospective student was thoroughly examined to see if he had aptitude the society could use with the founding of the first Jesuit school in Coimbra, Portugal, by the Empress's youngest sister, Catarina, and then it refers to Ignatius Loyola's romantic interest mm -hmm. in that particular royalty, the principal Jesuit occupation became teaching. By 1556, three-fourths of the society's membership were dedicated in 46 Jesuit colleges to learning against learning, to indoctrinating minds with the learning of illuminated humanism as opposed to the learning of scripture. Now this is why Martin Luther mm -hmm. made his speeches yes. and why he said that the universities and the schools were cesspools. Yeah, and they had to re a reformation of the Absolutely. education system. This network would expand by 1749 to 669 colleges, 176 seminaries, 61 houses of study, and 24 universities, partly or wholly under the Jesuit direction. Mm. That's how they went. And then the sad sentence, many Protestant families sent their sons to Jesuit schools. Despite Martin Luther's early warning, in an appeal to the ruling class, which we just read about, that unless they diligently train and impress scripture upon their young students, schools will prove to be widening gates of hell. Now the Jesuit curriculum, or ratio studorium, method of study, gave scripture significant inattention. Yeah. So the scripture wasn't mentioned at Decide. all. In fact, where I taught, when scripture was even mentioned, mm. it was only to ridicule it. And that is what happened to our universities. Mm. And I was at a Protestant university, not a Catholic mm. university. So I wonder our educated people that have trained at Jesuit institutes, mm -hmm our learned gentlemen that study at these cesspools of rationalism and social equality, how their minds can even grasp the veracity of Scripture. They have been so poisoned yeah. by what they have learned that it disqualifies them from being in the pulpit in many cases. Yeah. Unless, of course, they have a total transformation. Yes. And then he has something very interesting to say. 
The curriculum of the Jesuit colleges came to be adopted to a great extent as the basis of the curricula in European colleges generally. Wrote Dr. James J. Walsh, Dean of Fordham University Medical School. Moreover, according to Dr. Walsh, quote, this is on page 66, the founding fathers of our American Republic, that is to say the groups of men who drew up and signed the Declaration of Independence, who were the leaders in the American Revolution and who formulated the Constitution of the United States, were the majority of them educated in the colonial colleges or in corresponding colleges abroad, which have followed almost exactly the Jesuit Ratio Studorium. Yeah. The fact has been missed to a great extent in our histories of American education. Embedded in the Ratio Studorium, he continues here, were the elements of entertainment, mm -hmm. of dramatic productions, composition, rhetoric, and eloquence. I can add debate to that. Mm. These courses interlinked with the spiritual exercises to intensify the experientiality of Catholic doctrine over scripture and Protestantism. So that means the spiritual exercises of Laihola was implemented in those different areas to without people even knowing. Yeah. They, they resulted in a genre of spectacular plays mm. that won distinction as Jesuit theater. theater. <laughs> now, it carries on here and it gets very interesting. The first Jesuit theater was performed in Vienna in 1555. Can you see this is in the time of the Reformation? Yes. This, this is, is the Counter-Reformation. Yes, this is the Counter-Reformation. Nearly 45 years before the emergence of Shakespeare. It was instantly popular and quickly spread to other parts of Europe. Between 1597 and 1773, more than 500 Jesuit theatricals mm. were staged in the Lower Rhine region alone. Fascinating. Yes. Jacob Biedermann's play, Cenodoxus, a point-by-point -point rebuttal of Luther's teachings proved the power of entertainment to achieve political reform. Political reform through Jesuit theater. Now, Jesuit theater, of course, exists today yes. and is alive and well and calls itself Hollywood, which, of course, is the witch's staff. Mm. Holly is the wood that it is made of, and it is used by witches to cast spells. He writes here, and this is very interesting, he writes here on page 67, England certainly produced the greatest Jesuit playwright of them all. Mm. Shakespeare. Yeah. Nobody thinks of him as a Jesuit playwright, right? No. Nope. Shakespeare occupies us with the human process in a way that subtly marginalizes the Bible exactly pursuant to the Jesuit mission. Mm -hmm. Shakespearean characters do preach and they preach religion, a religion. But it is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the Gnostic illumination of Medici. Learning that Shakespeare preaches the stuff of Jesuit schools. Not surprisingly, the secret traditions of Templarism claims Shakespeare, at least the writer of his plays, to have been a Rosicrucian steeped in Medici learning. I can read one more. <laughs> it's a quote. The philosophic ideals promulgated throughout Shakespearean plays distinctly demonstrate their author to have been thoroughly familiar with certain doctrines and tenets peculiar to Rosicrucianism. In fact, the profundity of the Shakespearean production stamps their creator as one of the Illuminati of the ages, 
Who but a Platonist, a Kabbalist, or a Pythagorean could have written The Tempest, Macbeth, Hamlet, or The Tragedy of Sibylline? Who but one deeply versed in Paraclesian law could have conceived a Midsummer Night's Dream? So these are some of the thoughts in the book Ruler of I mean, Evil. Just another thought. Um, entertainment also includes music. Absolutely. So now when we talk about a new education, we have to look at all of these points. Mm -hmm. They want now on a universal scale to bring in this uniformity of thinking. And as Macron has said, let us closely, closely watch what is being taught. And let's get hold of the young minds. Did he mention an age of three? Yes. From three years uh, old. The Catholic Church via the Jesuits has a saying which says, give us a child up to the age of eight and I have him forever. Hmm. That's amazing, right? That's amazing. And when it's a spell. It's like a spell. Now, I can, I can testify in my own life. Hmm. I was an atheist, but I was raised Catholic. And I was raised in a system that I abhorred. And I became an atheist because of the teaching of hell, because my mother was a Protestant. Everybody knows the story. I'm not going to go into the details now. But it made me an atheist. But when the chips were down years later, the thing I returned to was Catholicism. That Give me a child. And it is only the scriptures that, that set me free. Could you get you out of that? Only the scriptures. And through the scriptures a light entered that could dispel that darkness. Yeah, and from three years old, yeah. Then that's barely when they start thinking. Yes. So now rulers of evil speculated that there might have been a ghostwriter to Shakespeare, right? And many people are wondering who that could be. And there are some conspiracy theories out there, but Shakespeare is a, a misnomer. Mm. He has an address, but he doesn't have an address. He has a birth date, but he doesn't have a birth date. He was married, but there are no certificates. There is no proof that the man ever existed, existed other than folklore, right? If you think of today, how many people write books with ghost names? With ghost names. Now, if you, if you look at uh, William Shakespeare and you look at another man known as Francis Bacon, then there is a very interesting comparison. They were contemporaries. They lived at the same time. Or they were one and the same. <laughs> so let's have a look at a comparison from Wikipedia. Francis Bacon, former Lord Chancellor. Francis Bacon, first Viscount St. Alban, KTPC, QC, also known as the Lord Verulam, was an English philosopher and statesman who served as Attorney General and as Lord Chancellor of England. His works are credited with developing the scientific method, which is basically the basis of all university teaching today. And remained influential throughout the scientific revolution, according to Wikipedia. He was born 22nd of January, 1561, York House, London, United Kingdom. He died in 1626. Highgate, London, United Kingdom. Influenced by the scriptures? No. No. Influenced by Aristotle, Plato, Niccolo Machiavelli, Roger Bacon, and more. Education, Trinity College, University of Cambridge, University of Poitiers. So these people were trained at these universities and this man was a philosopher, but based on Greek Gnostic philosophy. Mm. William Shakespeare was an English playwright, poet, actor, widely regarded as the greatest writer in the English language and the world's greatest dramatist. He is often called English's national poet and the bard of Avon. 
He was born 1564. Look over here. Born 1561. Stratford upon Avon. Died 1616. This one, 1626. There are many that believe that this Rosicrucian, Francis Bacon, steeped in Medici learning, as we read in Rulers of Evil, and knowledgeable in the cabal and Gnosticism, was a very probable candidate as being the ghostwriter for the Shakespearean plays. But be that as it may, that is just speculation. But this is the education yeah, that the world cherishes. So, Martin, we have now compared what Martin Luther said mm -hmm. with what the Jesuits did to education in the world. The world has become a world of chaos, a world of violence, and as the authors that we have studied have claimed, cesspools of hell. <laughs> yeah. And now they are talking about a new education. Mm. One that will bring everybody into line with a particular way of thinking. Individualism must go. A group collective paradigm must come into play. And for that they have coined a new buzzword, which is called solidarity. Solidarity. So I think we should uh, start a second episode where we further discuss how this will develop, because this is such an important issue. Yeah, and it's going somewhere. And where is it going? It's, uh, yeah, maybe unexpected for some, but this re-education, like you've mentioned now, it's not only in learning. It's in entertainment, in all of these things. All of these issues. The groundwork has been laid. The pillars of Protestantism have been brought down. The last vestige of Protestant teaching lies on the streets covered in blood. Yeah. And now it is time to bring in a new education that sweeps away all religion, as we have seen, and brings in that illuminated Gnostic teaching that is at the heart of Jesuit teaching. Yes. We have a Jesuit Pope. We have a Jesuit school system in mm -hmm. the world. And the world is ready for a new education. We've seen that we've got from both sides of the political spectrum, a push towards Catholicism as well. Correct. But you know what? The Bible has an interesting verse. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Lord Jesus says, Woe to those. It were better that a millstone be tied round their necks than that they should make one of the least of these my little ones mm -hmm. stumble. This is a confrontation with the God of the universe yes. that will culminate in the final events on this planet and for humanity. This is the choice that people will have to make. And we will deal with that in part two. Let's pray. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we do indeed need a new education. But as Solomon said, there is nothing new under the sun. What has been will be. And as Martin Luther called for an education where the word of God was central. So I pray that your people will realize that they have to give their children a new education with a renewed emphasis on those issues which lead to eternal life. Grant us wisdom in a time of great trouble and adversity. May the God of all wisdom and the God of all true education be with us as we approach the climax of your earth's history, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching this video. To subscribe to our channel, click here.
To get notifications, click on the bell. To watch the next video, click here. Thank you.